Good morning from, uh, and greetings from um, freezing cold and snowy Chicago. We're going to get started on our um, webinar momentarily. Uh, we're going to be discussing a very, very strategic and most interesting topic covering a lot of material in a short order of time, and that is really focused on the future food service and those trends that are what we said are going to have a transformative effect. I'd um, like to acknowledge up front the great support we received from our friends at IFTA, that's the International Food Service Distributor Association, who has sponsored all the technomic talks we've done over the past 18 months and will continue to sponsor them. So thanks to Mark and his staff. Um, I'm Bob Golden, and as soon as I can move. I'm going to be um, today's speaker. I'm Executive Vice President of Firm and Head of the Research and Consulting Division. My contact information is there. You're all going to be on mute, but you can, as you know, type in questions and we will respond to you after the webinar, which is go being recorded and will be posted along with this um, deck on our website, uh, www.technomic.com. So please do ask questions and comments are more than welcome kind of want to set the stage for where we've been as an industry. Uh, a lot of what we're talking, we are talking about the future of the food service industry, but it does have direct relevance, and we're going to reference retail because many of these trends are converging. But relative to food service in general, if we kind of take a long-term look over the past 30 years, we've been with a few blips. We've had consistent growth. We've gained share relative to retail. The growth has been very heavily driven on the commercial side by chains, both quick service and full service. Again, the recession, the Great Recession was a speed bump, but we have recovered. But there have been few what we would call major industry disruptions, generally favorable demographics in a favorable cost, in a predictable cost environment. So I think you know, what our view is we've had, quote unquote, clear sailing. Where we are today is, in many ways, a pretty uh, a good news scenario. We have macroeconomic tailwinds, GDP growth, low inflation, low interest rate, job creation, strong stock market. As a consequence, and obviously right now we have uh, gas prices, which are low gas prices, which are boosting the mood of the consumer. Food service is growing. It's growing faster than retail. And unlike past five years, Independents are doing extremely well pacing the growth and opening units again. There is some not good news. As we all know, costs are problematic. Uh, Cisco reported just a 6% inflation, so that continues in largely due to the meat and um, dairy. But costs, not just food costs, are problematic. And, and, and adding to that is the very limited pricing power many major segments of the industry appear to have due to consumer uh, unwillingness or un inability to spend more. We have a chain market that in large swaths, most notably McDonald's, is really struggling. And we continue to have an oversupply business. But with that being said, we do feel that over the next 10 years, and we're looking ahead 10 years, that we're going to have a much more challenging, it's going to be exciting in a lot of ways, but a challenging environment with respect to political, economics, environment, health, competition, and it's going to lead us to a much more a much different market structure, different operating environment, and will lead to different business practices. And what we feel are going to lead the change in the industry, and some many of these interrelate. So it's hard to necessarily um, isolate each, but we will talk about. Uh, each one in some level of detail. One is climate change and what that is doing to the business practices and the attitudes and the policy issues relative to the government, state and local and federal. Changing and intensifying in new consumer demands, one of which relates very specifically to the move towards local and localization. Another which is transparency. This, extent, this extends well beyond consumers, relates to trade customers. The exciting and huge potential of technology, most notably big data and predictive analytics, polarization. And where we see the industry trending is towards a more specialized and in, in many ways less consolidation 
and we'll we'll kind of talk through this argument, present our forecasts going forward. Just again, also keep in mind I mentioned earlier a, a problematic and challenging and uh, very difficult cost environment, and this is going to continue. In fact, we think it's going to worsen. We we have the minimum wage mandates in over 25 states, and there will continue to be. We have worker shortages and skilled positions, and I think uh, it's fair to say our friends at IFTA will agree that the driver shortage is at a crisis stage, and we see benefits going up. So we're going to see, uh, and, and we are actually seeing a change in the employment environment, whereas even low-skilled jobs in selected markets are in short supply. So we, you know, that is going to pressure wages. We are going to see at least a 50 to 100 percent increase in labor costs, and we have been benefited. Barry Friends talked about this recently in another uh, webinar, but we have been, we've we've had the benefit of relatively mo moderate labor costs, and again, that's changing commodities and inputs. We have just very volatile situation relative to global demand, prices, availability, regulatory compliance. A Many relate to, but not all relate to FSMA, Food Service Modernization Act, compliance, labeling, traceability, licensing and standards. These are going to go up 50% minimum, having just sat through a conference uh, with FMI on some of the issues related to FSMA compliance in the supermarket business. The complexity and the costs are pretty mind-boggling, but they're real. Transportation logistics costs, we are faced with rail shortages. Trucking rates increasing rapidly because of the driver shortages, congestions, infrastructure repairs. So we're, again, going to see a big ramp up here. At least 50 could be as much as 100%. And then we'll get to climate change relative to some of the property damage, delays, utility costs, insurance, and how that's affecting business practices, and a whole host of special assessments, taxes, user fees, uh, largely by uh, municipalities and states that are in perilous budget, and then we, of course, continue to see uh, political discussion about gas tax and carbon taxes. So those will continue, and those are very likely to be uh, enacted with cost. Climate change, the President and Nestle, I think, puts it well here, and they are the world's largest food and beverage company, and they're, they're by, his, uh, Mr. Box's point is that the weather patterns, it's going to Climate change is going to affect crop yields, water available, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. And that's our view, that climate change will affect products. It will affect price. It will affect market performance, operational efficiencies. It just by kind of reminder, we probably all like to forget, although you know this weekend snowstorm in Chicago was a good reminder, of what really does happen with extreme weather, as we know we had the polar vortex, now what's referred to as polar vortex. Uh, certainly don't remember ever hearing that term till last year, but it, we had extreme weather, and we were able to measure its effect in food service. And in a nutshell, it put us in a hole. Industry um, food service was down for the two months, 3 to 4 percent. Overall, in weather-affected markets, it was down 7 to 8 percent. Distributors reported sales declines of 5 to 15 percent. We saw property damage service disrupt, disruptions, supply chain disruptions, and very significant um, peak in uh, demand disruptions from a consumer. People just couldn't get out, and those are occasions that are lost to food service. So I think, again here, not to belabor something that is pretty obvious, but again, it, 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 the global change research, this is a nonpartisan, you can see all the sponsors here, uh, National Science Foundation, NASA, EPA, it affects human health, agriculture, food security, which is near and dear to our hearts, our hearts, water supply, transportation, ecosystem, and it's the point here, it's going to be increasingly disruptive and very difficult to plan for, but the idea here is that you need to plan for more volatility, and that is the, the headline on that one much, much more so than we have in the past, where, as I noted earlier, we haven't had the disruptions. Importantly, when we look at the consumer, um, what we're seeing is a value-oriented consumer, largely out of economic necessity. I'll talk about that in a few moments. We do see that consumers 
increasingly are health oriented. I put that in quotes because health is being redefined to, in, to really focus on fresh, natural, additive free, and I think that is a total different dimension than what health meant in the past. Certainly polarization, we'll talk about that. Ethnic point here being really authenticity, no new news there. The last two I think are very significant. It, we are really seeing a much more, I, we, I think we can call it liberalization if you like, or more activist consumer. And the, the key point here is that there's demanding transparency, they're demanding sustainability, they're demanding large consumer groups sustainability and local practices. And do not mind and often insist on regulation and mandates to achieve their objectives. We're also seeing an urban increased urbanization, which implies convenience, sophistication, tends to benefit independence, but also has some major implications on the types of units that are being up size, cost, and lots of supply chain implications. Many of these demands, this is a survey we did with a large scale of operators from various segments. And the question we ask is, Will the following have a great or moderate influence on your purchase decisions in the future? And we think it's very, very significant, the, some of these ratios. Is it overstated? Possibly. Health and wellness, uh, no doubt, has always been, has been on the list for the last five to ten years. But look at the, the magnitude of agreement on the fact that buying local, no chemicals and pesticides, clean labels, sustainably produced, no hormones, antibiotics, humane animal treatment, 80 plus percent on almost all of these. Uh, so operators recognizing, again, this is commercial and non-commercial large scale survey we did a little while ago, uh, in indicating that these are priorities for them. And I will suggest that these were not on the radar screen five years ago. I mentioned earlier one that we continue to see picking up speed. I think, you know, observationally, this is uh, three, four years ago we started talking about this. It was tended to many view this as a passing fancy and it only for high-end independents and high-end markets. Well, it's really becoming a very significant factor in retail and food service. It has marketing cachet. We see it accelerating and really having huge implications given that local to consumers has multiple dimensions. It implies fresh, it implies food with a story, high quality, sustainable, direct delivery, clean labels, community oriented, will grow, will intensify, and again major implications on what products are, how products are manufactured and distributed and where plants are located and major implications on brand communications and brand relevance. Another area here that we're seeing increasing demand um, and that's in the area of transparency. I th our friends at Ketchum had a, Lynn Etherton had a great quote, when questions don't appear to be answered or clearly addressed, the assumption is that we're hiding something. And what does this mean in the food service context? It means that operators and or consumers and or other trade customers increasingly are demanding full disclosure of what's in products. How are they grown? How are they processed? Where are they from? What's the carbon footprint? Pricing, what is the true net cost? How do we unbundle costs in the effect of what are considered to be transparent sellers like Restaurant Depot is huge in this industry. We see a lot of demand for living wage, fair trade, diversity, more disclosure of executive compensation, especially relative to some of the wage issues that we talked about earlier. And then, of course, the, the environmental impact on the planet, animal welfare, conservation. All these things are becoming increasingly demanded transparency, uh, full disclosure, making it apparent to the consumers and to the customers what, what your products and what your businesses are along these multiple dimensions. Sustainability, 
We can talk for hours about this subject. We have done other webinars. You can access them. They were outstanding on our website. But sustainability means lots and lots of things. It doesn't relate strictly to environmental. It has, concert, it has uh, humane, safe, community, food dimensions, people dimensions, product dimensions, processing dimensions, very broad swath. And Unfortunately, this is a consumer survey we did last uh, earlier uh, in 2014. Consumers don't necessarily believe in food service is a very high profile industry, as is food in general, but especially food service in particular. They don't necess consumers don't necessarily believe that the industry is properly addressing environments, social issues or sustainable issues and social issues when we say that we mean things like diversity, living wages, work environment. So I think what consumers are saying, we're looking for better corporate citizenship. It means very different things, and this is a challenge for everyone in the trade to kind of prioritize, but what consumers are increasingly requiring and demanding better stewardship on all these issues. On the pot, on a flipping the the discussion a bit, we are extremely um, optimistic about the impact and the applications that big data and using that very broadly will have on food service, which has underutilized or certainly not even remotely optimized predictive analytics and other big data tools and to the extent that retail and other businesses have, including people like Amazon. And you know, I think the success that Croak continues to enjoy, which they attribute largely to their ability to mine data through date, customer data and best customer data through Dunhunby, um, is 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 telling. And I think there's tremendous opportunities for this industry. And the quote here from Aramark: uh, "Food quality is still important, but it's not number one anymore. Now it's data, it's analytics." So. Technology, the applications, can, we can have moving towards dynamic pricing, affecting product assortment. Some of the U.S. foods and Cisco has used big data in their category management uh, uh, initiatives. Demand planning, demand forecasting, market reach and effectiveness, all of this, the applications, the implications, and the possibilities are really exciting and certainly something that everyone should in the industry should start to give much more serious attention as the accessibility and availability of tools uh, becomes much more, and, and the sophistication thereof becomes much more readily available. Polarization is a concern, and polarization, there's attitudinal polarization, political polarization, geographic polarization. It does have a major impact on the industry growth, where the growth's coming from, how we price, profitability, and I'm thinking in terms of the rampant discounting that so many chains and other operators have to do to in a, in a high cost and a rising cost environment to keep customers engaged, especially we believe lower income customers, and then uh, government policy and just some a chart here that kind of illustrates the point. Uh, I'll, I'll go through this very quickly, but. The average household in America spends about $2,600 a year on food service. The household cohort, the group that's growing fastest in this country, is the less than $50,000 households. It's 54%. It's, it is the fastest growing. And they only spend $1,500, and that amount is flatlined. The $100,000 a year more is roughly a rounding up 20% of households and 40% of spending. and they're spending at twice the rate of the average, and that is um, increasing. But the fact that the sheer number of households, and that really does have some major implications on food service and, and the future of the food service and how we price and what kind of products. Going forward, we do think specialization, uh, single item specialists are, are limited item, and I think the rise of fast casual is is a is a prime example of what we would consider a very focused menu, less equipment intensive. It, and we see this as 
affecting menus, operations, who, and what kind of businesses, blurring the segment, and the overall market structure. So again, we do think, and in this, this extends also to distribution channels where we actually see that the specialists are going to remain very viable and they're local market focused and product focused. So we do, again, see that specialization being very good at what you do, not trying to be all things to all people, perhaps that's the mistake that a lot of the casual dining chains have made and are suffering through. Um, one of the reasons in our, in my view, that food service, one of the top reasons that food service has enjoyed the growth it has over the last 30 years is, in a nutshell, they haven't faced really um, highly effective retail or supermarket competition. Food service has always had the advantage of experiential elements. What we are seeing now is that retail in what we're called food service alternatives, kind of quasi food service, quasi retail, are going to are working very very hard. They they fighting back, battling mightily and successfully to minimize the restaurant advantage of experience, quality, and convenience. And that is a very loaded and, and important point if you buy into the argument. And what we're seeing here is a tremendous explosion. You know, and, and many of the investment bankers are, are certainly agreeing with this because they're funding a lot of these. In home-delivered meals and meal kits, home-delivered foods, Amazon Fresh, grocery delivery services, either on a subscription or one-off basis, personal chefs, food trucks, grocerants, Italy and Chicago and New York does over roughly 100 million per unit and it, it has certainly impacted everyone in the local market. We think next generation vending has potential. It hasn't begun to manifest itself, but it's, we, we believe that it will. Fresh prepared foods, we've talked about a lot. We track. We're working with FMI on a number of very important programs. It's the fastest growing food service segments, and we're seeing growth accelerate there to a 7 to 8% annual growth rate. Delivered snack box. And there's a whole host of players. Are they all going to survive? No, but many of them are worth watching. And, and you just see a lot of interest from the investor community and from consumers, as we'll show you here. While usage of a lot of these services is still 10% or less, there is familiarity. And CSA is uh, community-supported agriculture. That you, We should add that to the list, as we should add farmers markets, which have tremendous following in major markets. And the other thing we're seeing is that at-home options are becoming much more uh, higher quality and much more compelling. So you look at pod machines like an espresso machine, Vitamix, SodaStream. I think you can safely argue that these are in many ways are directly competitive to away from home experiences. In our, our, all these businesses are growing very, very rapidly and are uh, affordable for a large number of households. Same day delivery, you know, Instacart is um, expanding. Amazon Fresh is an experiment. Will uh, continues to be a test. We want to monitor. All indications are that the company is extremely committed to making it work. Google Express, lots of other uh, uh, players looking at this market. Food is a 1.3 trillion dollar business, so and it's a stable business, so all these pass the test of market size. So let's kind of look forward a bit. I think I mentioned earlier that growth had been driven by chains, both on the retail and the food service side. Oh, looking ahead the next five years, what we're doing is we're seeing a little bit of a flip in terms of where the growth is coming from in retail. We see growth coming from the club stores, the non-traditional channels, dollar stores, fresh format stores, limited assortment, of course, online, drug, and other, whereas the traditional supermarket super centers, we don't see much growth. Food service chains will remain stable, but we see independence is going to be pacing the growth. So this is a real reversal of prior uh, growth patterns and dynamics. If you look at going where the sources of the growth is, if you simple math, food service is going to be about, there's going to be about 500 billion incremental 
dollar growth in today's dollars in the industry. I'm sorry, in, in uh, this is with inflation. So 500 billion extra dollars. We think food service is going to capture the majority, but a very small majority, 54% if you want to do the math of that. And it by no means is going to be a slam dunk because you see the tremendous growth of non-traditional channels, 165 billion. So 33% of the total industry growth, and that's very, very formidable and will continue to evolve. On the distribution side, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but where we see a lot of growth is in the club store and cash and carry channel and in the online channel, which is going to go from a 1% to 4% share in the next excuse me, 10 years. And uh, the, the more traditional channels, power distributors, chain distributors, are going to be somewhat more challenged to uh, achieve above industry growth. In a wrap in a wrap up, what we do think is that business is fundamentally changing. The change is not happening overnight, but it is changing. And I think many of these uh, points we, we we talked about, there is major implications to this change. First and foremost, its supply chain is going to need a major rethink, revamp, as fresh, local, artisan, and all these other. things things we talk about, home delivery, online, uh, gain traction, increasing traction for you know, everyone in the industry, innovation, reaching your customer, and efficiency are critical. And we'll suggest that many companies need more than tweaking, but a new game plan. So this is our kind of bottom line for this. I do want to point out a few things. One is that we will be issuing in the next six weeks a major in report preliminarily called Food Industry 2025. It is going to be a long-term, very detailed look at how the industry is going to change in both the food, service, and retail, or away from home and at home, that will be available. Secondly, we will be continuing this series of uh, economic talks. We are going to be doing quarterly updates of the economy, consumer, retail, and food service. We'll be issuing a schedule of those talks very shortly. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for their attention. I do hope you have some questions that you'll address to me. And this will conclude the webinar. Again, uh, I thank you all for your time and attention and hope it was valuable. Thanks.